Hey everyone, it's Katie from Life Fluent, and I have a simulation that I cannot wait to share with you guys. Something that is easy to implement in your classroom, and it really teaches teens about how dopamine works in the brain and how it helps in our habit formation, but also how it helps with addiction. And so today I'm gonna show you step-by-step -step how to set it up, how it requires almost no prep at all, and also how I can assist you making the whole process easier with a lesson that I have available for you here, or you can do it for free in your classroom and create your own slides to go along with it. So let's get started. You're gonna start this simulation by showing what a normal, healthy, habit-forming process would look like in the brain. So you're gonna assign one student to be the brain, 10 students to be the neural pathway, and then you'll have one student be a mover, and then another 10 students that will be the dopamine. So here is a little diagram of how you will set them up in your room. Now how our dopamine works, how our brain works, is that the brain has a message it needs to send to the body, to the mover. And it's gonna use the neural pathway to get that message over. So you're gonna have around 30 strips of blank paper that you're gonna write up in a pencil, and the brain is gonna name a command. So it will say, for example, clap or jump. Whatever the action it wants, the brain's in charge, okay? At least in the first round, the brain is in charge. So the first round, you're gonna have four minutes on the timer, and you're gonna have someone in the class either be a counter counting the dopamine or you can also be the counter depending on your classroom size. So obviously adjust the time and adjust the size of the simulation based off of your classroom. Once you have the timer up, here's how it begins. You're gonna tell the brain they are in charge of putting this message on the paper, sending it through the neural pathways. The neural pathways are gonna quickly pass it down one by one to the mover and the mover will do the action. Once the dopamine sees the action, they're going to each give a high five to the brain. Now, this is a normal healthy brain, which means not all of the 10 dopamine are gonna high five the brain because very few actions and healthy actions are gonna flood the brain with dopamine. So I would say seven tenths ratio, so seven out of the 10 dopamine will give a high five and the other three can sit and relax. And this will be the first round. They can also help with the counting. And the point of the first round is to collect dopamine high fives. So you will be counting it. And at the end of the four minutes, together as a class, you'll say, in this round, we were able to collect 40 dopamine high fives. And everyone claps, yay. This is a healthy brain. This is how it works. This is how habits form. The brain wants more of these dopamine high fives. They want the reward. And so they're gonna keep doing this again. Now for the second round, everything is gonna stay the same, the same amount of time, the same people are in, the same function is happening, the brain still is writing messages to the neural pathways, but the difference is in how an addiction normally develops is that there is an action that will flood the brain with dopamine, right? So instead of the seven out of 10 dopamine, it's gonna have 10 out of 10 dopamine high-fiving the brain, which is going to be more and exciting, right? And so, Throughout that process, each time the brain tries to redo that action, one of the dopamine will sit down. So it goes from 10 to nine, to eight, to seven, to six, until you have the solo standing dopamine, which means that if your goal for the game on round two is to get the same amount of dopamine as the first round, they are going to have to speed up the neural pathways are gonna start skipping each other. They're gonna be passing it as fast as they can. At some point, they're even going to override the brain in a way where the brain is writing it down and the pathways are already trying to take the message. It's really gonna become chaotic. Those four minutes, students are gonna be yelling, they're gonna be passing notes, they're gonna be making it super intense and the dopamine will be high-fiving but less and less. And so the numbers, you're not gonna be able to in the second round get the same amount of dopamine as you did in the first round or you might break even if people go really crazy. And how this works and how this represents a brain that is in an addictive state is it's showing that your brain can no longer get the same effects from that action as it used to. You can no longer get that high or that excitement and that same level. You're constantly chasing, but the more you do the action, the less 
it rewards you until at some point it's almost like the brain doesn't have control like it did before before it was able to in round one write it down pass it on but as the game goes these neural pathways are getting faster and faster and faster and the brain in a way in the second round will become kind of enslaved to this process and it'll be very tiring for them so what i like to do is have the simulation in the hallway just so that you have the the space for them the neural pathways are going to get really close together during that last round um they're going to be skipping each other it, it'll be really fun and what I like to do is I like to give very little detail at the beginning. I just tell everyone what their role is. They know that they're dopamine or the brain or the mover. They know that we're gonna be talking about addiction, but you wanna keep it really light at the beginning. And then after that, you're gonna come reconvene back in the classroom and ask the brain, how did the second round feel? and you're gonna ask the movers, you're gonna ask the uh, neural pathways. And from there, you're gonna anchor it into what is an addiction and how is it that our neural pathways and our body and our brain begins to be hijacked by this need for more. And we're gonna start on a very scientific level. You're gonna get the breakdown of how it works. But then what I like to do is I like to play a couple different videos of people talking about their experience. And addiction is so much deeper than just the dopamine. Why is it that some people can have the same substance that floods their brain with the same amount of chemicals and yet one person has an addiction over another or can develop that addiction easier? And there's a couple of different factors. We're looking at environment, we're looking at genetics, and we're also looking at trauma. And I really like to talk to the students and let them know if you have holes within your life, places where you're hurting or in pain, you are more likely to look for something that will solve that problem. A lot of addictions start because people are feeling anxious, they don't have proper coping skills yet, and so they're leaning towards something that will soothe them. It's self-soothing. It's a, a feel-good drug, whatever that may be, whether it's a drug or a phone or all the plethora of addictions that people can choose from. and. This gets in some really good conversation with your students, and I highly recommend not rushing it, really talking about how we are all searching for ways to feel better and how trauma can impact the decisions that we make. And then I wanna end the lesson with an amazing comic called The Rat Park, and it's by Stuart McMillan. Um, I'll link it here below. He's fabulous and it talks all about the study in the 1970s with rats and they found that if they were to give two different environments for the rats, the, the rats that were in a cage that had nothing, no stimulation, nothing warm, no friends, they're isolated, they were more likely to go towards morphine and addictive substances and have an addiction develop than the rats who had a park, right? They were surrounded by other rats. They had other things in their environment um, that made them feel whole and they weren't trying to run away or escape. And so the lesson goes into a really good, deeper question of how can we take our cage and turn it into a park? What are the lifestyle changes we need to make to make us happier people? So we are less likely to crave um, an addictive substance. And of course, it's, it's simplified. There's a lot more complexity to it, but this lesson in general is a great way to start the conversation. I don't at all talk about treatment or breaking addiction. This lesson is just about habit formation and prevention. And I highly recommend you do this with your students. It'll take around 60 to 90 minutes. I say 60 to 90 because it depends on how chatty your group is. Um, my classes are always very chatty. So um, I can split this, this lesson into two different days and really work on think, pair, share and discussion questions throughout the time. If you are interested in getting this lesson and you wanna use it in your class and you don't wanna have to create the slides or you don't wanna do the discussion questions, here is the product for you to get. Um, it will just be super easy and breezy for you and go ahead and you can get it on my website or also on Teachers Pay Teachers. I can't wait to see how it goes. Let me know, like put a comment down, let me know how your class responded to it, um, how crazy they were in the second round. Uh, it can get wild. <laughs> so 
Um, I'm curious to see how, how it worked for everybody else. Um, be sure to like and subscribe to this channel if you're interested in more health lessons and activities and tips. I'm trying to be more consistent here on sharing some of the things that I'm doing in my health class. So hope to see you around. Bye everybody.